You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hello, everybody. Welcome to an INCJ broadcast. And this is a, a, a special event uh, because we've got, got the, the pleasure, actually the privilege, uh, of launching a, a United Nations uh, report. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to hear a, a, about a report that was published in March 2004. It's called Digital Rehabilitation in Prisons. And we'll be hearing a great deal about this report uh, about on a research project from the f- five people uh, who have been intimately involved in making it happen. And uh, we brought them together this today from different parts of the country, uh, or different parts of the world, uh, to hear all about it. Now, rather than me introduce them, much better for you to hear directly from from them so that they can say who they are, uh, where they're from, and what their role has been in the project. My name is John Scott, and I'm sitting in Bedford, north of London in the UK. And my job is just to introduce them and to take you through today's podcast. Uh, But let's start with uh, Victoria. Please tell us who you are and what your role in the project has been. Yeah, I'm Victoria Knight. I'm an associate professor at De Montfort University. Um, my role in, in this project was um, to work as one of the lead researchers or lead consultants. Great. Welcome. Uh, Stuart, what's, what's your job? So uh, my name's Stuart Ross. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and, and I've been working with Victoria on, um, on the preparation of the report. Great. Matthew. Hi, morning, John. Uh, my name is Matthew Bernard Stewart. I'm an associate expert at UNICRI, which stands for United Nations Interdigital Crime and Justice Research Institute. And I'm based in uh, Turin in Italy, where our HQ is. And uh, I manage various research initiatives and projects on rule of law and criminal justice uh, reform. Uh, and my current role includes uh, co-managing our, our project on digital rehabilitation in prisons. Um, and the study is part of that. Well, I'm glad you explained what UNICRI stands for. Um, it's it's a bit of a mouthful, but it it's, is, yeah. it's a really important agency and, and right right on the money for this project. So thanks for explaining that. Uh, Mana, welcome. W- what's your role? Good morning. My name is Mana Yamamoto. I'm working for UNICRI as a research expert the based in Turin now, and uh, I have been working for Japanese prison administration as a psychologist with PhD, and uh, I was in charge of the prisoners' rehabilitation using psychosocial treatment in Japan. So based on such uh, experience, this project and uh, considered by Japan and funded by Japan, so I organized this project with Matthew at Unicuri. Marvellous. Welcome. Lovely to meet you. Uh, and and finally, Alice, t- tell us about what, what you've been doing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alice Roberti. Um, I am a fellow at UNICRI. Uh, I mainly work on projects uh, to prevent violent extremism, but I do have a background in prison resettlement, specifically in the UK. Um, so when Mana and Matthew, who lead this uh, program from the UNICRI side, started uh, the initiative, they asked me to tag along and join them to to support however I could. Great. Now, ev- everybody can see what a, a diverse group uh, Unicri brought together to do this piece of work. And we're now this morning going to have a conversation, uh, hearing from each of you how this team w- was able to work together and, and produce produce the report. Um, but it's really important to find out, well, what were the origins of it? How did the project uh, come together? Uh, and my suspicion is we probably ought to ask Matthew uh, to start off, start us off on this. No, thanks, uh, thanks, John. And uh, as I mentioned, Unicri uh, is is a UN agency. Um, maybe I can give some more background as to what we actually do as part of our yeah. mandate. I think that might be useful. So Unicri is one of seven UN research and training institutes in the world. 
um, but it's the only one with a specific focus and mandate on on crime prevention and criminal justice. And it was uh, founded in 1968, so we've uh, we've been around for for a while. Um, but I suppose our our um, apart from our broad mandate, our our key uh, approach is really to be based on action orientated research. Um, so we 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 look out for new trends uh, and new pressing in issues in the criminal justice sphere, and we are very keen to to use applied research. What does that mean? That means really trying to identify what are the pressing concerns, what are the needs, what are the and what are the solutions, but to do so in a practical way that that makes sense for policymakers uh, and people who will be using the research in a practical manner. Um, and so. Um, Based based on that, um, we know of course that uh, numerous jurisdictions in the world have, have been exploring different approaches to rehabilitate people in prisons. There are many UN uh, rules for the treatment of, of prisoners: the Nelson Mandela rules, the the Bangkok rules, the UN rules for the treatment of, of women prisoners. Um, but what we've noticed is that um, in the recent years, there's been a there's been a trend uh, and an increasing pace of development in introducing uh, use of technologies to support the rehabilitation of prisoners. Um, the question to us was, well, what does this mean? Um, what are the challenges? How how should we do this properly uh, in a way that's aligned with the existing UN uh, rules and, and norms? Um, and we were also ha lucky to uh, have the support of, of MANA, who was seconded uh, from the Ministry of Justice from Japan to support our work here in, in Turin and in our various country offices. Uh, and thanks to MANA's also interest in this topic and support, we were able to uh, get get the, the financial support from, from Japan um, to, 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 um, to investigate more this, this topic. Uh, and uh, and that's that's essentially that's the origin of the project. Uh, and then based on that, we were we 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 were able to sit down together and think, okay, what do we need to 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 actually start the research? Uh, and that's where we were able to then get in touch and and with Victoria and Stuart as the experts in in this field and 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 kickstart the process. Mana, tell us uh, why was Japan so keen to get involved in this work? Yes, um, in line with the, the UN standards and rules, uh, uh, prison administration explore the effective approaches in the context of prisoners' rehabilitation, such as education, mental health, vocational training, and uh, psychosocial treatment. But uh, throughout these efforts, not only in Japan, but also uh, many jurisdictions uh, face various in implementation challenges, uh, such as um, limited resources and uh, adverse prison environment, and the difficulty of simulating real life situations or ensuring regular contact with family and access to community support. So, so we co considered that the digital technologies have the potential to overcome such challenges. So we are considering that um, explore such uh, countermeasures to using technology into the prisoners' rehabilitation. So that is the point for our uh, deciding such a project. That's good, and certainly as an INCJ, we we know that around the world, uh, digital technology is a fast growing part uh, of work, both in prisons and in the community, uh, but perhaps under researched. So that was an important motivator, I imagine, for for Unicri. Thank you. That's 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 a really great start and, and important to know what the origins were. Shall we uh, move on then to to ask the question? OK, so you reached out and you went to Victoria and Stuart. Um, now, this report is based on, I think, an initial year's work, if I'm right. Um, and uh, Victoria and Stuart, perhaps you could tell us what's been undertaken in that year and uh, the report's um, structure. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit about how you've arrived at the report and, and, and what work's been undertaken in the first year. Yeah. Shall I start, Stuart? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 
I, th- um, I, I think um, for me, and I, I, I really want to congratulate Unicre and colleagues for commissioning this project because, as 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 you've mentioned, John, you know there was a paucity in kind of consolidated research and and uh, sort of bits of of knowledge scattered around, and and so it was a brilliant opportun- opportunity, certainly for me as a kind of researcher in this area, is to actually undertake a consolidation and review and reflection of current knowledge and evidence. Um, but I think I want to go back a bit bit before and actually say what Unicre did was put together a really good brief and some of the key I think um, messages um, or or, or as part of that brief was about as Matthew's already said about the work needed to be applied and relevant to practice and policy makers but also I think for us Stuart and I was to kind of look at the value, the social value and the ethical principles mm. of digitising. As we all know, there's, there's, there is a dark side to technology. And if we we put technology into a prison setting, then it's, 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 there's a lot of ethical and moral questions around that. So I think Unicre did a really good job to set out that brief to actually for us, for Stuart and I to explore this in more detail. So right from the start, Stuart and I had a really good brief to work to. Um, and, and, and as all research projects, they are time bound. Um, Stuart, do you want to say a little bit more about then what what we did? <laughs> um, so, look, the other thing I think that's important is so Victoria and I have both been working in in on projects to do with digital rehabilitation for for a while, and I guess one of the things that you observe when you do that is you can see instances where there are very well thought through projects that that are driven by a clear sense of strategy and uh, that are informed by contemporary research. And then you also see a lot of stuff which is honestly pretty ad hoc. And and I think, you know, if you think about the experience that all of the correctional jurisdictions went through with the COVID pandemic, that was a very good example of how people were suddenly confronted with a, a problem where there were digital solutions available to them that they had to adopt very, very quickly. And, and you know, some of that had beneficial outcomes and some of it didn't work out quite so well at all. And so I guess one of the things that we were trying to do was to look at the experience of different jurisdictions and to kind of set out not just a single, you know, here's, here's the way to do it, but rather to say, there are actually different ways that you can tackle this problem, um, and that some of that's going to be contingent on the resources that you bring to bear. Some of it's about the different goals that you might have, but you know, you there are choices that that you can make about how you proceed down this digital rehabilitation pathway. Okay, tell us about how you structured the report. Yeah. Um, basically, the report <laughs> it, it was it was a big puzzle, wasn't it, Stuart, of how to present this this story, and we obviously had to give readers and provide evidence of, and obviously work to the brief that was set out. And um, <laughs> we, we our brief was to write a thirty page report, guys, right? <laughs> a bit longer than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, it was impossible because of the number of, of of areas that we needed to cover off. And a lot of that was about, I suppose, you know, being an academic, the sort of theoretical underpinning and, and how do we think about digital rehabilitation? How can we explain that and tell that story? So in the end, um, what we did together um, as a team is, is, is divide the report into three broad parts. The first being, I suppose, the ethical, methodological and sort of practice framework where we covered off on things like ethical principles, describing how we, you know, we did we did the the direct this initial exploration and then offer readers um 
I wouldn't quite say a definition, but the different ways in which we can understand digital rehabilitation. And I think our position from the beginning was to take a very broad view of what what that meant and offer readers a description of of that. And then um, obviously we've got a kind of description of what what um digital rehabilitation is but then the challenge is for services right prison services is how do we operationalize this so are, is there a single pathway well no there isn't um so we had to describe what what we've called in the report a sort of how how from what we've seen um and we consulted with a number of experts uh, across the globe about how they develop a digital rehabilitation strategy and and that was very complex to put that into words wasn't it Stuart and mm, yeah. <laughs> um and then um the second part of the report was looking at the different types of digital rehabilitation and how we can understand that um so for example what we thought the best way to present this was um to cover off on things like ed, um, using technology to support education and vocational training um treatment and behavior change so that's that sort of therapeutic stuff um using technology to support people into re-entry and resettlement back into the community, family contact, and really, really important um, um, in this was around staff engagement and training. They've got to support people in prison, right, and, and what, what they needed. So we, 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 added, we added that in as well. And for each of those sections, we added good practice guidelines, didn't we? Not guidelines, I think that's too strong a word, but but ideas for good practice from, from the evidence that we saw. That's right, isn't it, Stuart? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I suppose the other thing that we were trying to do um, with that part of the report was to give people some kind of an idea about what's out there in in the field of digital rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. But often for practitioners, what they're concerned about is a particular, you know, they might be, they might be working in a particular space, but you know, what we were trying to do is to give a sense of the breadth of things that are, you know, present in that digital rehabilitation space and not just focusing on the kind of the high-end technology solutions. I mean, there's some really interesting things that are going on. Uh, that use very, very simple digital interventions. Um, and so we were trying to, you know, say, well, you know, this is not all, this is not all uh, conditioned on, you know, big injections of funding and technology support and things like that. There are lots of different things that you can do, you know, across a range of digital methodologies. Yeah. That's an imp imp important message. It doesn't have to be expensive or high tech. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to move us on, if I may. Um, perhaps this is a question for Matthew. What's what's the target audience for this report, Matthew? That's a great question, and that's a question that we we ask ourselves for for each of our studies, no matter the topic. And um, I would I would say, broadly speaking, we want this research to reach out to to the people who uh, who will be responsible for the design and delivery of the rehabilitative programs uh, in prisons. So practitioners, but not only, I would say also policymakers. Um, and I think that's that's a challenge that we face as, as a research agency, but also uh, academics, uh, how to ensure that research doesn't just collect dust. Um, you know, invisible research is by definition, as we know, low impact. Uh, and so that's why I think the methodology as well of how this research came about was, was an important part of, of the process, engaging with, with a different range of experts and stakeholders. So we engage with practitioners, academics, uh, people with lived experience um, who volunteered to give their time uh, so that we could explore with them their perspectives and, and, and practices. Uh, and so um, I think the aim is really to, to, to we were able to put together um, to, to summarize kind of the, the theory behind digital rehabilitation, I believe, uh, with, with the study uh, and, and, and in doing so, um, 
we're given the opportunity for practitioners to understand the different pathways, as Victorian Stewart mentioned, of, of how digital rehabilitation can can work in practice. And we're given an outline and also some key driving questions to support them to develop, or for, or for those who are not engaging with digital rehabilitation, to and get to start the process of of strategizing for how to introduce technology in an ethical manner. Um, and so I would say yes, a broad, broad, a broad audience. Uh, but I suppose an audience who 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 have has the tools to actually put the recommendations in, into practice, hopefully. Mm. Well, it, it, it's a fast changing world, isn't it? Uh, uh, Mana and Alice, um, you'll know about w what happens in actual prisons, whether in psych, you know, psychologists in prisons or what happens on the ground. Uh, do you think uh, ordinary prison officers or ordinary uh, probation officers or people working in the community might be interested in this report? I think so. Man, sorry, I'm gonna start. Um, I I hundred percent think so. Um, as it has been said, as Stuart said, this was not about only about looking at the high level tech. This was um, also structured and designed in a way that could be relevant and relatable to as many key stakeholders as possible. So even in a Victorian prison in the UK, um, you can read the report and like as a Correctional officer in a prison in a Victorian prison in the UK, you can read the report and find something relevant to you and find a few like sections, a few structures, a few ideas, a few again, good practices that you can think, okay, like we could do this in my uh, in in the prison I work in. Um so I think it's definitely interesting for a, as Matthew said, for a wide um and many types of, of target audiences. Mm. Uh, and in Japan, uh, what sort of people would be interested in the content, do you think, Mana? Yes, of course, um, prison administration have been interested in such experience because um, Japan has uh, launched the new project the introducing technology into the prisoners' vocational training using okay. uh, virtual reality, uh, metaverse, and so on. And also, uh, not only in Japan, but also the other uh, countries. Uh, basically, in prisons, the use of technology and the internet has been avoided in prisons. A lot of um, potential risks. But uh, so I think the efforts within the community supervision are more advanced in terms of the uh, introducing technology. So. I mean, the both prison administration and the community of supervision has both uh, interested in such uh, experience initiatives. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to uh, the big question, which is, uh, what do you think are the key outcomes which are uh, expressed in in the in the report? So let's start with Stuart. Maybe, uh, what do you think are the are the key outcomes? Um, so uh, can I take up a point that, that so you, you're asking about who the target audience for this was, and I think one of the target audiences, and this is, I think, an out, for us a, an important outcome, is, is the people who are in prison. So one of the big problems that we face in prison systems is that um, uh, where you have this kind of choice between, uh, there are a lot of prison systems that where the, the you know, the attitude is, Digital technology is just too dangerous. It's just too risky. We need to, you know, we need to control access to that. And the consequence is that people in prison are simply not being exposed to and educated in the way digital technology is influencing, you know, the, the daily lives of all the rest of us. And so we have, so one of the ideas that we worked with with the project was this idea about digital inequality. So I think one of the outcomes for us, hopefully, is that the report provides a basis for getting jurisdictions to think about this problem of digital inequality and to think about how it is, how the, their activities in the digital rehabilitation space can be, can be developed, can be used to address that problem. So that, for me, is a really important outcome. Yeah. Victoria? 
Yeah, there was a lovely example. So for, for each of the sections of the sort of main body of the report, we included case examples to kind of just give um, readers a kind of real world um, look at some of the examples um, that that uh, that we um, we found. And I think one of my favourites was um, the uh, in the report, the Argentinian model um where um it it really was about people's needs and um what happened was we've already mentioned covid um <laughs> i don't think there's many uh, conversations had, had these days where we don't mention covid but it shone a light on digital inequality and so um a community advocacy group, group that campaigned for um children's rights meant that um, um, children didn't have access to their parents who were in prison. And so this this project kind of um, um, increased momentum to encourage the Argentinian prison services to um, provide telephone access for children and, and, and their parents who are in prison, because that's so important, as we know in other research, that fam healthy family contact is one of the protective features of reoffending but also you know that 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 kind of human contact and so um it was it, for me it was about one of one of the outcomes was about human need um and and and, and people that are also in, impacted by um inequalities right from, you know, and we know that that kind of long pain of imprisonment. So that was a, a really lovely example to highlight, I think, this issue of inequality and how that can be overcome. But with partnerships, not just about the prison itself, but community partnerships. So that extends, you know, who is this report relevant for? Lots of NGOs and um, voluntary organisations are involved in this project that make these things happen. And, and bring about you know about delivering the need for humans so that was a really big outcome for me that I really enjoyed um, documenting and observing. Great uh, other key outcomes? Yeah. Stuart, uh, maybe a couple, couple more? Um, okay so i think one of the um things that we were trying to do so if you think about the way digital technology uh, how we all experience digital technology so the technology moves very very quickly and uh you know you in, in a way we you know we're we're adapting to that almost on a day-to-day -day basis and one of the consequences of that is that we can get into a situation where um the things that we experience, the, the the way that digital technology is presented to us is driven by things like, you know, commercial imperatives. It's driven by, uh, you know, perceived, um, uh, afford, perceived advantages to, to us in the way that we use a particular, you know, technology. And what's missing out of that is a, um, is a, is a kind of, systematic um, taking into account of all of the ethical and um, uh, you know and protective issues that arise when we do that and when we're talking about uh, the impact of digital technology on people in prison some of those are really really important things so issues like um, you know who owns the data and what kind of data privacy provisions apply so I guess one of the things that we were trying to do with the report is to highlight those issues at a point in the development trajectory of digital rehabilitation where people can actually start to factor in those kind of considerations, those ethical and regulatory considerations as they're thinking about what it is that they want to do in the digital rehabilitation space. So again, that's for me, I think that's, you know, if we if we could see um you know, a, a, an, an outcomes in that regard, to me, that would be a really, really important achievement from the report. Mm -hmm. So you've almost got to sort out the stumbling blocks 
really early so that you can get down to the practical things yeah. that will yeah. make a difference for prisoners yeah. in their rehabilitation. Because we've got no just, well, there's no basis on which we can say we don't know that these sorts of things are potentially problematic. I mean, we've all experienced it. I mean, you know, we've all, you know, we've all seen how digital technology unfolds in ways that were unanticipated and that yield all sorts of problematic, you know, social outcomes. So we can't say, oh, you know, that was a surprise. We know that, that could, that's a risk. Uh, the question is, how do we anticipate, how do we actually do the work now to think about, well, what are the ethical, what are the, the policy, what are the regulatory systems that we need to have in place in order to protect the rights and interests of people in prison. And of course, in prison, you've got the security uh, dimension as well, which makes it more yeah. complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Victoria, uh, another outcome? Yeah. So, what, 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 through doing this exploration and obviously writing the report and, and, and the applied nature of, of, of the work that we've contributed to and, and put together. Um, what we were able to provide readers was um, a kind of um, some good practices and and and, and checklist um, and and kind of what we said was look these are some of the things that you should be checking off on in order to kind of move towards a strategy these are the things that practitioners and stakeholders need to consider to ensure exactly what Stuart said about mitigating risk um, um but also being rights based um considering inequalities um responding to individual need and 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 digital has the promise of being able to individualize a service so so you know if we think about um um, for example, learning needs or neurodiverse needs. There's the promise that technology can help mitigate against some of those barriers, for example. But also things like being gender responsive and being sensitive. And what we're saying to, I suppose, developers and those responsible for tech, technology is is look these are some of the the guidelines that we, we we can say based on the knowledge that we know already um but also with safety uh, in mind and and safety of of all stakeholders so again one of the um, case examples was a family intervention but the safeguarding measures that are involved in creating sort of family conferences using video calling for example so those kind of safeguards so we were able to provide a, a checklist or a toolkit for the kinds of things so i think that's a really good outcome for the report um uh, and because what Stuart and I were able to do was review and consolidate this these pots of evidence that are popping up <laughs> all over the place. Agree. Well, let's let's ask that question about good practice of the of the UN uh, representatives mm -hmm. as, as well as the uh, as the academics. So, um, uh, what uh, have have we discovered about good practice? Um, Matthew, Mana, and Alice. Um, do you have a dimension about that in the report too? I mean, I, I think I would, I would, I would tie it into the to the to the discussion around digital inequality uh, and the issue of digitalization more generally, and it ties in with other other pieces of work that we're doing, looking, for example, at the use of AI by law enforcement. Um, that we know that uh, you know we need to have clearly stated ethical principles. With a clear understanding that digital digitalization in general can be good, but it also has a has a strong potential to create various forms of inequality and harm. So, from a UN perspective, but generally speaking, I think to have a two to do no harm approach is is key, and to have a people centered approach. Um, you know, decisions should be driven by by the needs of of, of the people incarcerated. Not just the promise of technology, uh, not just yeah technology that, that that is sold as okay. This is going to cut costs. This is going to cut 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 time time. That can be good and useful, but it needs to be based on 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 human needs foremost. Um, so I think that is really the, the underlying 
uh, message that I think that I that I hope we we that comes across with with the study. Yeah. Um, uh, other good practice points, uh, Mana Alice, would you like to comment? Mana, do you want to go? No. Um, yeah, no, I think I was, uh, <laughs> I would have said the same thing that Matthew uh, raised about the people-centered approach, which is also what Victoria mentioned about gender responsiveness. And it's when we talk about gender responsiveness, for example, it's all about understanding the needs. What is the need of girls? What are the needs of women? What are the needs of boys, of men? Um, and in this case, what are the needs of all of these people? in uh, a prison setting um so i think uh, that was really that's really what what driven us um and i think we i hope we said we succeeded in um in yeah communicating this to the to the audience to the reader when uh, when picking up picking up our report what one of the things I, I i like is the fact that you're mentioning so many different countries even in this conversation um and i think comparing different settings uh, and getting illustrations from different countries is is very rich source of material and, and i think if, if i may add i mean for me before we started the, the discussions with victoria and stuart for me i had this idea of digital rehabilitation being just just the use of virtual reality headsets and very advanced technology but as you said uh because of digital inequality you know you and different jurisdictions having different laws each prison services will be coming from a different place and, and digital liberation could be just uh, allowing a prisoner to have uh, access to a phone so they can connect with their family. And for, so for me, that, that that concept of, you know, different entry, entry points, different pathways was, was quite key. I think it's important as a message that you know, rehabilitation can happen digitally um, in different ways. There's no one size fits all blueprint. Uh, uh, it cannot exist. And a smartphone puts huge computing power into 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 a small piece of kit, doesn't it? So it, it, it doesn't have to be uh, hugely expensive. Um, Victoria and and Stuart, uh, any good practice uh, points that you'd like to make? Yeah, I just want to pick up on 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 what. Alice and Matthew have just said is that I, I think. Um, I think what we've done is is kind of say, look, not one size fits all, right? And when we look at the diversity of jurisdictions, that we can't just take a solution, say, from the UK and export it to Kenya, right? We have to understand the social and cultural conditions of a jurisdiction and within those services they you know complex well our criminal justice system right is a very complex web of rules and regulations and laws and different types of people and hierarchies and social practices and values so um this idea of digital just being kind of shuttled and injected into a service so what we've tried to do is 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 in terms of good practices is is actually encourage people to consider that understand the needs and social conditions of of um and i think it's also shed a light on me for the kind of gaps in knowledge um but let's not go there you asked me about good practice right so things around how um services have partnerships so some solutions are dealt with in-house but those that are a little bit more let's say advanced and i'm cautiously using that word have very strong partnerships with outside agencies um but also <clears throat> those that have um a uh, what we call digital maturity or kind of lead in digital maturity, that the digitization agenda is society wide, so something that we call e government. So those those that are able to correct caress have the conditions in the wider society in order to 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 progress, let's say. So uh, understanding their own context is 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 really important and there's a there's a set of activities that people can do within that um what we also recommend is things like um not only assessing need of users and that includes staff and other stakeholders but also um 
um, getting user feedback, right? Mm. There's no good putting something in and saying, there you go, get on with it. There's a whole heap of training that needs to go with digital and how digital is supported within a prison service and, and its people, um, but also ongoing evaluation of 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 the kinds of interventions or solutions is really really important so we encourage with there there's some of the kind of checklist um good practices there uh and Stuart? yeah look I, I mean in a way i just kind of reinforce what victoria's just said i think you know one of the things about digital rehabilitation is this is not like going into a shop <laughs> and you know choosing products off a shelf there are very few well-developed products that are that are um, that a, a jurisdiction can simply select and uh, implement without any kind of adaptation. Um, so um, you know this for for most jurisdictions proceeding down the digital rehabilitation path, you know it really is a matter of thinking about thinking through the process you know from from the starting point of well, what are you know what are our goals you know where does this fit into our rehabilitation strategy um you know what are the what are the kind of policy and regulatory frameworks that we need to have to support this how do we know whether it's actually achieving the kind of outcomes that we want so um so i think one of the things we have to be a bit careful about is is not presenting this as being a kind of recipe book for doing digital rehabilitation. It's more like a set of, um, you know, questions and methodologies and uh, ideas that, that jurisdictions can use to help them navigate their way through what is a fairly, it's already a fairly complex environment and it's, and it's only going to get more complex. Uh, and it's going to get bigger. And it's so, going to get big. So let's turn our eyes to the future. Um, what are the prospects and what are the next steps for the project? Matthew, tell us. Yes, uh, thanks. So, you yeah, know, we're very lucky to be in a position, thanks to the support of, of Japan, to, to have a, a pilot phase uh, where we'll get to use some of the findings or some of the recommendations and best practices outlined in the report and, and, and implement them in practice. Um, and we've uh, identified. We'll be working in partnership together with uh, Namibia and, and Thailand uh, as as the two key beneficiaries uh, for this phase. And we had uh, an exciting kickoff workshop uh, together with all of us in uh, in Japan in in Tokyo in March as part of the launch event of the study. Uh, and of course, these are very different jurisdictions, uh, each with their own uh, challenges when it comes to to, to prisons. Um, and so I think this is uh, we're still in the early early phases of, of this stage where we are trying to get kind of collect to the contextual needs of, of, of each country. Uh, but the idea is to then help them uh, really understand how they can implement digital solutions within their criminal justice systems again to improve the, the outcomes of uh, prisoners' rehabilitation. Um, but I think this is also an opportunity for us because we know that um, there is a lack of proven tools and services when it comes to digital rehabilitation in prisons. It's an opportunity for us to really think more carefully um, what, what, how, what, what, are the, what are the evaluation, what are the, the tools and systems that need to be to exist to support countries to go through this process. Um, so yeah, we're really lucky to be starting uh, soon. Well, uh, I don't know about other listeners, um, but that's got to be exciting to have two such different countries in, uh, in different parts of the world uh, where a pilot is going to take place. So um, congratulations to you as, as a team, as a project for having uh, uh, attracted both the investment, but also the interest to do that. So as we draw to a conclusion, I'm going to ask each of you the same question, um, which is, is there one main point that excites you about this project? Um, so uh, as, as, the, as the question uh, sinks in, um, I'm going to ask Stuart to start. Okay, so um, 
So one of part of my background is I've I've been working um, not just in, in in a university, but I worked for a um, a provider of re rehabilitation services for for some years, and so I, one of the things that's you know been a kind of truism, if you like, for prisoner rehabilitation is it's a it's it's a, a kind of essentially a problem of scarcity. The 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 need for rehabilitation is enormous. Um, the costs of providing it by traditional means are are significant, and often it means that people either don't get very much, or possibly even not anything at all if they're in a remote location, or you know. So so I think one of the big one of the exciting things about digital rehabilitation is it holds out the promise of extending the, if you like, the kind of the reach of rehabilitation in ways that uh, have hitherto been, you know, we've been prevented from doing just because of the, you know, the sheer cost of delivery of rehabilitation services. Great. Okay. Shall we, uh, Alice, would you like to comment? Yeah, of course. Um, I think I'm going to draw from my previous experience again from in the UK. I remember I, I studied criminal justice policy back then uh, in the UK um, and I remember I then started uh, working straight away in the rehabilitation settings uh, for, in prison and I remember thinking when I started working like these, like the reality of the ground does not match what I just studied. Like, <laughs> I, I couldn't find the link between what the academia had taught me and the reality of the day-to-day -day work uh, in a prison setting for prisoners' rehabilitation. Um, and, and it was, of, of course, like challenging, but also sometimes frustrating. And I think this project kind of uh, links the two uh, and it's it's really exciting because it comes from again like a huge um, input and efforts from uh, Victoria and Stuart coming from academia but at the same time with the support of a UN agency and with the final uh, goal outcome to to actually try to to apply what we learned to mm. to real context to in this case Namibia and Thailand uh, and maybe who knows um, somewhere else uh, in the future. So I think this is really what what excites me. I can say. <laughs> Great, thank you, uh, Mana. Would you like to answer the question too? Yes, um, indeed. From the perspective of policymakers and pro practitioners, especially, uh, it is true that the technology can be the countermeasures to the challenges of rehabilitation efforts in prisons. And the use of technology seems attractive and we are easily tempted to get a jump on it. But uh, there are certain points that um, must be kept in my, our mind when adopting such technology, uh, such as uh, its use in consideration of ethical and human rights. So I think it's a very significant that we are able to identify such points in this project. And in addition to that, there may be uh, resistance among staff, prison staff accustomed to the traditional practices so due to the biases, their biases against technology or the perception that implementing technology uh, it will be the, simply the benefit to inmates. So the raising awareness of staff is really essential. So through the uh, next step, working with Thailand and Namibia, we are very looking forward to creating uh, such staff training modules, adjusting their own situations and needs. Thank you. Victoria? Yeah, um, it's really nice to hear everyone's um, uh, what excites them. Aside from working with these lovely people, um, um, I'd like to follow on what Lisi said. And um, I started off um, as a kind of novice researcher moons and moons ago, over 20 years ago in, in I suppose, in this space. And um, but at the same time, I was working as a teacher in a, a prison setting. Um, so uh, sort of for about four years I did that and I, I, I became quite disheartened and I kind of thought how am I going to make some change and I don't think I was a very good teacher to be honest <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, but I really loved research and my commitment to be a researcher was about seeing research, using research in motion and helping those responsible for our prisons to make sound um, informed decisions. So it's a real privilege to kind of watch this project unfold so that kind of observing and having an opportunity to reflect is what excites me in this space and matthew yes i would echo all of uh, all of the above i i, I think you've been able to, to to bridge that gap between um theory and and, and policy and, and practice is is uh, is a great opportunity uh, and a privilege to, to to be able to try and do so. Obviously, it's a pilot phase now, so you never know exactly what will come out of it, but that's part of uh, the fun. And I would add also that I think I'm personally getting my energy from from everybody who works in this in this uh, space, uh, starting from this, the group of experts that we assembled for, for the study um, and, and our partners in Namibia and Thailand. I find that people that work in rehabilitation um, do so with I, I I utterly respect the dedication and commitment that they that they have, uh, and I find that very energizing, and they're very willing to to give up to give their time and 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 support to 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 help um, enhance our our understanding and, and knowledge and, and practice. So uh, uh, I think uh, yeah, it's going to be an exciting journey going going forward for sure. Well, thank you everybody for your contributions uh we're going to draw to a conclusion now um but our listeners will want to know how they can get hold of the unicri report uh and uh, it's available on the unicri uh website it's called um uh if i can just uh, check it's called uh digitalization uh in prisons and uh go to the unicri uh, website but also you can find it on the uh on our w- website that's incj and you can get the link there as well now as we conclude i noticed that matthew used the word bridge and i think you're building a digital bridge uh, for offenders as they leave uh, prisons and go back into the community and what important work that is and as i say uh, goodbye and thank you to you we say goodbye to our listeners and join us again on incj next time you want to listen to an important conversation goodbye, goodbye. thank you john goodbye Bye. Okay. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.